Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Well, today there is a lot to cover and it's going to go fast. And so I ask you, are you ready? Okay. Colonel Mustard in the library with a candlestick. Miss Marple, Scotland Yard, Sherlock Holmes, Nancy Drew, the Hardy Boys, Murder, She Wrote. What are we talking about today? Mysteries. Is there anybody who hasn't read one? Is there anybody here who hasn't gotten on an airplane and seen somebody with a mystery opened? We love them. Part of the reason we like them is that the literary genre that includes mystery moves from order to disorder, back to order. That's why they're satisfying. They preserve for us a vision of justice. That's why they're satisfying in a deep way. We love to go from order back to order. Did you know that um, Jesus was the mystery of his day? Everywhere he went, people said, who is this man? Why is he here? What's he about? Who, who did he just say he was? Who do you say he is? Who do I think he is? What's his message? What's his purpose? Even the people who knew him best, his disciples who traveled with him, they were never quite sure. Even his family, even to them, he posed a mystery. And when that mystery darkened with his arrest and trial and death and burial, the mystery darkened into depression, didn't it? The depression of grief and lost hope. But beginning on the very day of his resurrection, beginning just those few days after his crucifixion, the mystery began to open and the light began to dawn. On that very day, there were two travelers. We always think two men, we don't know for sure, but two travelers walking along a road. They had left Jerusalem and they had left with such sadness and sorrow and so many questions. And another traveler came up alongside them and joined them. And as they walked, this new traveler listened to their despairing conversation. And this traveler with them was the risen Jesus. And he said to them, these are his words, how slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And the Bible says this in Luke 24. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures. What he showed them was that everything that had happened to this man Jesus accorded with the promises of God throughout all of their scriptures, which was the New Testament. For those two travelers, the mystery was opened that day. They were really the first to understand it all. So what did he say? What are the clues? Well, may I present to you today a Christmas mystery, clues of the covenant. The classic cozy mystery begins, as you know, usually in a quiet, beautiful, serene setting, often a village where people tend their roses and then sit down to eat scones and drink tea. And into that ordered, subtle beauty comes a crime, an evil, a death. And everyone says, what has happened? Who has done this? How do we understand it? What were the motives? Who can solve it for us? And in the mystery, there arises someone who follows clue after clue after clue until finally on the last page, what happens? All is revealed and the mystery is cleared up. When you get to the very end, truth triumphs, 
order returns, peace prevails, and the reader closes the book with a sigh of satisfaction. Now that plot from order to disorder back to order is the narrative, the storyline of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Order to disorder back to order. It opens in a garden. It's a settled, ordered beauty. There is peace and plenty. There is work to do and relationship to enjoy. But into this beauty, into this order and peace, comes a crime, a betrayal, a lie, a violence, an enemy. All is broken, all is disturbed, and disorder enters the picture. So today we are going to follow the clues. And let's begin with clue number one. Into the disorder right away in Genesis chapter 3, God comes, God speaks, and God makes a promise. In Genesis 3, God speaks to the enemy, the evil one, who is in the form of the serpent, the story tells us. God speaks to that serpent and says, from this woman Eve, whom you have deceived, will come a descendant. There will be enmity between these descendants and you, but this descendant, you will bruise him, but he will crush you. He will crush your head. There comes that prophecy which is a promise that the disorder that has come into the world will be addressed and order will be restored. It's on like the third page of the Bible, Genesis chapter three, right at the beginning, the promise is there. That's the first covenant gospel promise. Now let's pause a moment and define the word covenant just because I thought about that. I have signed so many contracts in my life. The only covenant I'm really aware of is one with my HOA, and I have solemnly covenanted not to park an RV in my driveway overnight, (laughs) right? It's It's a promise I've faithfully kept, but in the Bible, a covenant means so much more than that. Covenant are God's promises of who he is, who he will be for us, and who we will be as God's people. We don't establish covenant. We don't go to God and say, I have an idea. Let's make an agreement. God is the one who establishes covenant and who calls us into it. There are only a handful of them in the scriptures, and we're going to talk about them today. Is a covenant like a contract? Well, sort of. It has the legal gravitas of a signed contract, but it combines law and love, and so it also includes the intimacy of a committed love relationship. It's law and love blended. The covenants are God's gospel promises to us. Well, that's clue number one. And where does it appear? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3.15. God says to the serpent, you will bruise his heel, this descendant, but he will crush your head. And that's a promise. God's promise in Genesis 3 is the first one, but we have another one. Clue number two, the Abraham covenant. So many, many years have gone by, and this is how God acts. He chooses one man named Abraham who lives in a bustling cosmopolitan city, an idol-worshiping place, a pagan city, and God says, you... You, God establishes something and he lets Abraham know he is to go, to leave everything, his his family, his home, his father, his kinfolk, and he is to journey to a place he doesn't know, only God knows. And this call on him is so sure and so certain that Abraham obeys. Now we know Abraham from Genesis 12 to Genesis 25 
decades and over decades, all kinds of things happen to him. He makes detours that he shouldn't make and he prays prayers and he argues with God. And over that time, he is getting to know the God who has called him. God is slowly revealing who he is and what his purposes are. Not long ago, Brad preached a wonderful sermon about this. He talked about the miracle of God choosing a childless, older man and saying, you will have a son. I choose you and I choose your son who will found one family, who will become one nation, who will live in one designated area of land I choose. That is my purpose and my plan. Sometimes when I've talked to people about God choosing, they get uncomfortable. They feel like, well, if God chooses one person, isn't that a rejection of everybody else? God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your descendants, but through you, all people will be blessed. This blessing is for everyone, for all nations, for all people, right down to me and right down to you. So the call goes out to Abraham. Well, decades pass. God, God often, I say this to myself, often God does not act quickly, but God does act suddenly. After waiting, that child is born and that part of the promise opens up. One small thing happens. It's only a couple of verses, maybe one, but it's so interesting At one point in this relationship that they have, God says to Abraham, I am renaming you and I'm renaming your wife, Sarah. I know your real identity. I know your true name and I'm going to tell you what it is. And have you ever thought of that? That of all the names ever given to you, all the labels ever applied to you, all the worst things you've ever thought about yourself, maybe even all the vain hopes you've imagined, that God alone knows who you truly are. And then if you ask God, who am I to you? What's my true identity? What's my real name? You will find that the voice of God is truer and kinder than any other voice you hear, including your own. Let God tell you who you are. Well, the year the years pass and the son comes to be, that's Isaac, and he begins to grow up. One thing that Abraham has learned is what all of us learn. The more we know of the holiness, the majesty, the perfection, the utter righteousness of our great God, the more we know that we are small, our lives are brief, and we are so fallible in our wisdom and often so wrong in our choices. We are not perfectly obedient people. We know that. What do you do? That's, people have always wondered that in every civilization. How do I atone? How do I connect my past, imperfect, with the perfect God. What could I do? What would be enough of an offering? And so God creates an object lesson for Abraham. He says to him, take your son, your beloved son, your only son, Isaac, climb Mount Moriah, offer him to me. This is so not even imaginable to us, but not unthinkable in that dark day. You just know that from history, that sacrifices like that were done many times in many places, many civilizations. So Abraham climbs the mountain with Isaac. Isaac asks that poignant question, Father, I see we have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? Abraham replies, God, this is how the King James says it, God will provide himself the lamb. 
and we remember what happens as Abraham is prepared to make that offering. An angel stops him and shows him that in a thicket there is a lamb. He takes that lamb and sacrifices it. For one thing, that was an object lesson for the nation of Israel, which is reflecting that moral character of God. There will never be human sacrifice. We're just not going to do that. That won't be a question again for them. But also, it was a promise that that chasm of unholiness between human beings and the righteous God, that God himself will bridge that gap. God himself will make an offering of a lamb. When did that happen? What was that day? Where did that happen? Well, the next clue we have is the covenant with Moses. This is clue number three. So years have passed. Abraham had the fulfillment of one son. That's all he had of all those extravagant promises. But that one son founded a large family. That one family became a large, thriving people group. They actually became famous for having so many children. And they were living in Egypt. They became a despised minority, marginalized into slavery, finally. And God has more to do with his promises. So he says to Moses, Moses, you are the one who will go and confront the evil Pharaoh is doing and deliver the people. God is preparing to take the people now and move them to this land, the promised land that had been promised to Abraham hundreds of years before. And Moses is not a volunteer. Sometimes you're going to find out God has things for you to do and a call on your life and you want to say to God, I didn't volunteer for this. I don't remember asking for this. I didn't sign up for this. But God says, you, this is going to be your call and your job. So Moses says, but if I go talk to my people and I talk to Pharaoh, they're going to say, who told you this? Who gave you this idea? And what am I going to say to them? And God does something interesting. Now, you remember, what did he do with Abraham and Sarah? God told them their names. But now God is going to expand, enlarge the covenant relationship. And he says to Moses, I'm going to tell you my name And he gives them those four beautiful Hebrew characters so sacred to the Jewish people, they won't speak them out loud. And what they mean is, I am. In our Bibles, it's translated, the Lord. That's what he knows. He knows the name of God for the first time. Later on, this is decades into his journey, we have decades of the life of Abraham and decades of the life of Moses. After many decades of being with these people and following God, Moses prays a prayer. Listen, teach me your ways so I may know you. Show me your glory. And God replies, I will cause all all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, I am in your presence. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, or I am, I am, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Isn't that glorious? And then he adds, and not leaving the guilty unpunished. We're right back to where Abraham was. What are we going to do about the problem of our failure, our weakness, our moral frailty? The Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. And it says, Moses bowed to the ground at once 
and worshiped. Now this story is told in Exodus 33. So God has revealed his name, he's revealed his character, and he does that further because of course Moses is the one who climbs Mount Sinai, and what is he given? The Ten Commandments. The law, and the law is that expression of the character of God, of God's moral excellence and moral perfection. Those commandments say, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is how you and I will relate, this is how you will relate to each other. But above all, God is saying to these people who had been enslaved for so long, this is how you deserve to be treated. God settles such dignity on them, even saying to them, you are allowed to rest. That is an order. He gives them the gift of moral excellence and moral law. Later in Leviticus, these words, God said, I love this verse, I am the Lord your God, I broke the yoke of slavery from your neck so you can walk with your heads held high. That's the purpose of settling the moral law, giving that to us. And it has been a gift to us. The Ten Commandments are unsurpassed in moral excellence. They have been disputed, disregarded, and certainly disobeyed. They have not been bettered. They are the foundation of our own legal system, and they are the foundation of what we understand as universal human rights. Remember when God said, I will bless all people. The law is one of those blessings. But Moses too knew something else. At the very end of his life, he's making his final speech to the people. They are just about to pass into the promised land. He's not going with them. He knows he's in his last days. He makes a speech to them and he says, remember the law. He reviews it. Keep the law. He pleads. And he says, if you keep the law, if you obey these commands, blessings will come to you. And he lists blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. It's so wonderful. But then he has to say, if you don't keep these laws, if you disregard the moral laws I've given you and thereby violate the moral character of God, a curse falls on you. There are curses for breaking the law. And he lists these terrible consequences, which we all know, we can see them all around us. Who can bear the curse? Who is it that will be chosen to carry the curse of all of the disobedience done by frail, weak human beings? When did that curse come? Who bore it? Where did that happen? There's one more covenant I want to talk about. Covenant number, clue number four, is that right? Yes. This is the David covenant. Well, at last, so much that was promised to Abraham has come to be. The one promised son became one large family, which became one great nation, which moved into the exact physical geography that God had chosen long ago and promised to Abraham. There they are, and there comes the golden age of Israel. It's exactly 3,000 years ago. 1,000 BC, King David sat on the throne. We just know this from history. There was King David. God chose him. He is a younger son, not, nobody important at all, but again, God says, he's the one, he's the one. He is remarkable in his talents, great in his achievements. And again, we follow his life for decades as he knows God and trusts God and disobeys God and wrestles with God in prayer. We get to see the life of faith of David. David, one day, this is in 2 Samuel 7, he said, oh Lord, you've given me and my family this kingdom and I have a palace and I want to build a house for you. What a good idea. But God says, no, no, that isn't for you to do. 
I'm not asking you to build me a house. I am promising to build you a house. The house of David will be an everlasting dynasty. From your descendants will come rulers and kings, and finally, there will become a king who will be the ruler of an everlasting and eternal kingdom. That's the promise in 2 Samuel 7. Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, and David. Have the covenant promises been realized? Have the covenant promises been kept? They have within their lifetimes, but not in their entire fullness. Eve must have wondered about that mysterious thing God said when he promised a descendant whom the evil one would bruise, but who would crush the head of the evil one. Abraham had wondered what sacrifice he could offer to such a holy God to bridge the chasm between them. Moses knew that a curse would fall for all who disobeyed the law, which is all of humankind. Who would bear that curse? Through long years, the people waited for the promised descendant of Eve, of Abraham, of David. And then came Jesus. The New Testament opens with this one sentence. Hear this. Think of all the ways you might begin the New Testament. Think of all the words someone might choose. Listen. One sentence. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What does, what does Matthew know? And what is he telling people right away? The covenants. If you go to the other genealogy of Jesus, it's at the end of Luke chapter 3. And Luke 2 mentions, you know, of course, Jesus is a, he's the descendant of King David. He's the descendant of Abraham. And he takes it all the way back and said, and of Adam and Eve. He goes all the way back that we might understand what God has done over these great, great eras of time. Jesus is the promised descendant. Descendant. How is he the covenant keeper? Throughout his life, Jesus perfectly kept the law. The Bible makes that very clear. And when you go to the end of Jesus' earthly life, darkness descended. Literally, darkness descended on that terrible day of the crucifixion. In the midst of the darkness, there was God in the person of Jesus Christ, literally bruised in his body, literally bearing the curse that Moses had spoken of, bearing the weight of sin, paying that penalty. We see the covenants fulfilled in their perfection. And of course, in his resurrection, what did he do to the enemy who had bruised him? He utterly defeated and crushed his head. So Paul would write, Paul knew this too, Paul would write in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Do you hear how that resonates with the people who understood what Moses had said? He bore the curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So just as God had told Abraham, I'm blessing you and your family and your descendants, but this is for everybody. And that's the reason you and I are gathered here. Welcome to worship the holy God today. It happened. It's been said that the coming of Jesus is the hinge of human history. It's been said that with the birth of Jesus, time turned a corner. Everything changed. Over centuries and millennia, even before creation, this was in the plans and purposes of God. His intentions were for us. His intentions were towards us. 
to not leave us in the disorder and disturbance and destruction that the evil one brought, but to restore us to relationship with the God who made us. As Abraham and Moses saw, we are people who have a God worthy of our loyalty, worthy of our love, worthy of our worship, and worthy of our obedience. How does every mystery end? It ends with, and all is revealed. In some of the cozy, classic British mysteries, it happens like this. The smart person who's followed the clue says, shall we all gather in the drawing room? So shall we do that? Let's all come together and sit in the drawing room. All is revealed. Where is that last reveal found in any mystery book? Have any of you ever been reading a mystery and you got tired and you just flipped? Where did you go to? The end. You go to the last page. Who did it? Was it the butler? Let's find out. We're going to turn to the last page of our book. The last page. This is in Revelation. And here's what it says. The disciple John wrote in Revelation 19, I saw heaven standing open And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. King of kings and Lord of lords. When George Frederick Handel understood what we've talked about today and read these words, he turned it into the Hallelujah Chorus. That day, those people who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, oh, they left so dejected, desolate, without hope. And then Jesus showed them, just by opening the scriptures and revealing the covenants, that everything that had happened to Jesus accorded with the promises of God, the gift of God, for us. And you know how they replied? Here are their words in Luke 24. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures for us? Oh, may your hearts burn. May my heart burn as we understand what the God of all the universe has planned, purposed, purposed, willed, and done for us in Jesus Christ. In Genesis, God said, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. This is a promise to me and you and this is a reason to never stop praying for your children and your grandchildren because he is their God too. We pray that they would see and know him. Paul wrote in Colossians 1, the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the Lord's people. That's exactly what we've talked about today. And Isaiah wrote, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. The coming of Jesus was planned long ago and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he rules an eternal everlasting kingdom but he didn't arrive that way, did he? He came in such obscurity so quietly and in the vulnerability of newborn human flesh, there is a devastating humility in what God has done for us. Have you ever known someone who was so sure of who they are, so confident, so aware of every kind of power they had that they could take a low position easily? They knew who they were. That's what God has done for us. With that same quietness and that same devastating humility, he will come to any human heart 
open to receive him for the first time or open to receive him again or open to receive more and more as we grow to know our great God and what he's done for us. This is the word of the Lord today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for you have done great and marvelous things, things planned long ago. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is the great 